Welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to discuss hyperthyroidism. So this is a follow-up video to the two-part video on hypothyroidism. So please make sure that you have watched that video before you watch this video, because in that video, we recap basic thyroid physiology that we're not going to repeat again here. So hyperthyroidism then. In contrast to hypothyroidism, in hyperthyroidism, the level of thyroxine within the bloodstream is going to be far too high. So let me just remind you of uh, the two things that we measure when we're analysing thyroid function. So we measure free T4 in the bloodstream, and we also measure thyroid-stimulating hormone. And the normal ranges for these are 9 to 18 picomolar for free T4, and 0.5 to 5 milli international units per litre for thyroid stimulating hormone. So, in hyperthyroidism, free T4 is going to be too high, it's going to be greater than 18 picomolar. And I've seen patients with uh, free T4 levels up in the 40s, 50s, that's how high it can go. So it can get a good two or three times uh, greater than this upper threshold here. When the free T4 goes up that high, of course, that's going to suppress the release of thyroid-stimulating hormone by the uh, anterior pituitary, and therefore you will see usually that the TSH level is reduced hugely, and it's below this lower threshold of 0 0.5. So that would be the classic pattern for hyperthyroidism, a far too high uh, free T4 level and a reduced, suppressed thyroid-stimulating hormone level. So that's how, on the blood work, uh, you would diagnose someone with hyperthyroidism. Let's now discuss the different causes of hyperthyroidism. And in this case, I'm going to talk about four major different categories of causes for hyperthyroidism. So we'll start off again with number one the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. And this is another autoimmune disease. So remember in hypothyroidism, we saw an autoimmune disease, which was Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which in the um, highly developed countries, the rich countries, is the most common cause of hypothyroidism. Now we're seeing another autoimmune disease that affects the thyroid gland, which is Graves' disease. And again, it's a very common autoimmune disease. As autoimmune diseases go, it's quite a common one. Some autoimmune diseases are incredibly rare. Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Graves' disease are reasonably common. Hashimoto's is more common than Graves', much more common. But Graves' is far from being a rare disease. Now, what happens in Graves' disease? In Graves' disease, Unfortunately, the immune system starts manufacturing antibodies that can bind to the receptor for thyroid-stimulating hormones. So remember the physiology that I told you about in the uh, video on hypothyroidism. Remember, thyroid-stimulating hormone, it tells the cells of the thyroid gland. I'll just draw another little picture of the thyroid gland here. It tells the cells of the thyroid gland to produce and release T4 into the bloodstream. In order to do that, it has to bind to a receptor on the surface of the cells of the thyroid gland. So if I pull out a little cell here of the thyroid gland, so let's give it a nucleus. So let's say there is a cell from the thyroid gland. It will have on its surface a receptor for the thyroid stimulating hormone. And this we quite simply call it the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor. And thyroid stimulating hormone will come bind to that receptor. It will trigger an intracellular signaling cascade that will make this cell produce T4 and also release T4 into the bloodstream. Now, in Graves' disease, what happens is the body produces an antibody that can bind to and stimulate that receptor. So let me just draw a little antibody in here. So here we go, and its special antigen binding domain here is capable of binding to this receptor, and when it does, that will trigger the same intracellular signaling cascade, and it will activate the thyroid cells to produce thyroxin. So you're going to end up with massive overactivation of the 
um, thyroid gland because of the production of these autoantibodies directed against the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor. And we call these antibodies the anti, whoops, uh, the anti thyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibody. So it's a nice common sense name. And I'll just abbreviate antibody to AB like so. There are lots of other names that you might hear used for it. So you might hear TSI used as well, which stands for thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulin is just another name for antibody. Thyroid stimulating just means that it's an immunoglobulin or an antibody capable of stimulating the thyroids. You might also hear it referred to as TSI. But this name, you know, this name spells out exactly what it is, so it's a nice name to use. So what's going to happen then in Gray's disease? You're going to end up with massive production of thyroxins. You're going to end up with hyperthyroidism. You're also going to end up with a goiter in most cases, because remember when, you've, remember when we talked about um, hypothyroidism in um, the previous video, when we talked about iodine deficiency, where the thyroid wasn't capable of producing the thyroid hormone because of lack of iodine, and the brain chucked out TSH to try and stimulate the production of thyroid hormone, remember that TSH binding to the receptor continuously on the thyroid gland for a long period of time triggers the thyroid gland to get bigger and triggers the formation of a goiter. The same thing is going to happen here. This anti-thyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibody is capable of also triggering the hyperplasia of the thyroid gland so that you end up with a goiter as well. So not only do you end up with hypo, uh, sorry, hyperthyroidism, but you're also going to end up with a goiter, usually in Graves' disease. So Graves' disease is the number one cause of hyperthyroidism. And we can test for this antibody, by the way. We can do a blood test to test for the presence of anti-thyroid-stimulating hormone receptor antibody. Um, so um, we can quite accurately say whether someone's hyperthyroidism is indeed due to Graves by looking for the presence of this autoantibody. Right, next what I'm going to put on here is... Um, I'm just deciding which order to do it in. I think I will put this one second. I don't actually know which one comes second. Graves' disease is the main one to know. The ones next are all very, very important to know, but I don't know the exact order in which they come as far as prevalence is concerned. But the next one is a really important one to be aware of, and that is that over-medication can cause hyperthyroidism. So in the previous video on hypothyroidism, we saw that the treatment for hypothyroidism is to give people levothyroxine, to give them thyroxine, uh, which is absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract and ends up in the blood. If you give them too much of this, they're going to end up with too high levels of thyroxine within their bloodstream, and they will end up with hyperthyroidism. Very, very simple, and it is a common reason that many people may end up hyperthyroid because they are on the treatment, too high treatment, for hypothyroidism. So I'm going to put that as number two because I think it's a very important one to be aware of. Number three, thyroid hyperplasia. And this means the thyroid gland getting too big for some reason. Hyperplasia means overdivision of cells. So it means for some reason the thyroid gland has got too big. And there are two major different examples of thyroid hyperplasia. One is called toxic multinodular goiter, and the other is called a toxic thyroid adenoma. So toxic multinodular goiter. So we'll discuss this one first. So toxic multinodular goiter is a reasonably common cause of hyperthyroidism. If we discount over-medication as a cause of hyperthyroidism, after Graves' disease, it is the second biggest cause of hyperthyroidism. So it's a very important one to know about. And it literally just means that for some reason, the individual's thyroid gland all over has grown too big. So they've ended up with a goiter, and this goiter is productive. It's producing a huge amount of thyroxine, and therefore the term toxic here because it is having a hyperthyroid effect which potentially is going to be toxic because it can be very very dangerous hyperthyroidism. Oh and by the way I'd just like to put something um, in whilst I remember. Hyperthyroidism has another name that you will commonly hear 
uh, it, whoops, that's not how you spell it. Um, thyrotoxicosis is another name for hyperthyroidism. And that sort of justifies why we have this word toxic here, because we've also got it in thyrotoxicosis. So it's a toxic multinodular goiter because it's capable of producing thyrotoxicosis. Um, so it just means that the thyroid gland, for some reason, and it may well be idiopathic, the reason, we may not actually know why the individual's thyroid gland has overgrown, but it has overgrown, and it's now producing far too much thyroid hormone. That's what toxic multinodular goiter is, and it is if we discount over-medication, it's the second biggest cause after Graves' disease. And of course, in this case, they may have a goiter, they're going to have hyperthyroidism, but in this case, they won't have any antithyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibody in their bloodstream. Now, another major example of thyroid hyperplasia, and let's change colour to make it a little bit more interesting, uh, is what we call a toxic adenoma. Now, whilst a toxic multinodular goiter is a thyroid gland that has overgrown all over the place. You end up with a massively enlarged, symmetric, um, multi-nodular, because it doesn't end up perfectly smooth. It ends up with quite bumpy. Uh, but the whole thing has enlarged in that case. In toxic adenoma, instead, what has happened is a tumour has formed. And this tumour is not cancerous. It's an adenoma, which means it's a benign tumour of glandular tissue. That's what an adenoma means. It's a benign tumour of glandular tissue. However, it is productive, and hence we've got toxic in the front because it's capable of producing thyrotoxicosis. So in this case, imagine putting in here a great big tumour. In fact, I might even draw it. Let's say you've got a big tumour there of thyroid tissue. This is an adenoma. If it's productive, it can produce hyperthyroidism, and you would then call it a toxic adenoma. Whilst we're on the subject of tumours, thyroid cancer, of course, occurs but it is very, very rare for thyroid cancer to actually produce hyperthyroidism. Usually, if you get a malignant tumour of the thyroid gland, it's non-productive. It doesn't actually produce the thyroid hormone successfully and therefore doesn't usually result in hyperthyroidism. It's not unheard of for thyroid cancer to actually cause hyperthyroidism, but it's quite rare. Usually, thyroid cancer doesn't actually produce hyperthyroidism. However, these benign tumours of the thyroid gland, adenomas, they, in contrast, can actually cause problems because um, they can lead to the hyperthyroidism, despite the fact that they're not cancerous, they're not um, malignant, and they're not going to metastasize. they can actually cause damage in this other way because they are productive of thyroid hormone. So those are two examples of thyroid hyperplasia. Toxic multinodular goiter, which is more common than toxic adenoma, but be aware that toxic adenomas do occur as well. Uh, and then a uh, final cause then that I'm going to talk about of uh, hyperthyroidism is thyroiditis. So inflammation of the thyroid gland is obviously what thyroiditis means. And the major form of thyroiditis, not the only form, but the major one to know about is the one that we mentioned in the previous video, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. There are other forms, but they're very, very rare. So we're going to just stick to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, we said in the previous video, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is an autoimmune attack on the thyroid gland and that it destroys the thyroid tissue and therefore leads to hypothyroidism. So why on earth am I now talking about it in a video on hyperthyroidism? Well, the answer, and this is complicated, so it's really important to understand this, the answer is that Hashimoto's thyroiditis can actually cause a transient hyperthyroidism before it then leads to thyroid failure and profound hypothyroidism. So when you initially start getting this autoimmune attack on the thyroid, of course, the immune system is going to go into the thyroid gland. You're going to get inflammation there, thyroiditis. And it, is, it can actually end up stimulating the thyroid gland to release initially far too much thyroid hormone in the first few months of the disease. Then, as the disease continues, it will eventually destroy all the thyroid tissue and then you'll end up hypothyroid, you'll end up in thyroid failure. But initially, in the first stages where the thyroid tissue hasn't yet been destroyed, but you've got inflammation there, it can actually result in the overstimulation of that thyroid tissue to produce thyroid hormone. So that is how thyroiditis 
in particular Hashimoto's, because it's the most common form of thyroiditis, can actually produce a few months of hyperthyroidism followed by the rest of your lifetime being hypothyroidism. So be aware of that. That is a very common story for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, that initially they become hyperthyroid and then they become profoundly hypothyroid. And the hyperthyroid phase usually lasts for a few months maximum before they go into the hypothyroid phase. So um, there is actually a name for when Hashimoto's causes thyrotoxicosis. It is called Hashitoxicosis. So that is the name for that initial period, the transient hyperthyroid period uh, that it can be associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And it is important for me to stress, although this can happen, you can get Hashitoxicosis followed by the hypothyroidism, it doesn't always work that way. Some people will just get hypothyroidism and will never get the transient hyperthyroidism. So there are multiple different possible um, stories for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and indeed other forms of thyroiditis. So if you do know of the rarer forms of thyroiditis, such as Ducavain's thyroiditis, postpartum thyroiditis, uh, Rydal's thyroiditis, these can also follow that same cause where, course, rather, where they initially cause hyperthyroidism when the inflammation just begins in the thyroid gland, and then they cause profound hypothyroidism once they've actually resulted in damage and destruction of the thyroid tissue uh, and you've gone into thyroid failure. So be aware of that. Thyroiditis is also a cause of hyperthyroidism. So those are the four causes of hyperthyroidism that I'm going to discuss. Five, really, because we've got two different forms of thyroid hyperplasia there. We'll have a break here, and in the next video, what we'll talk about is the symptoms of hyperthyroidism and the treatment for hyperthyroidism.